The Ladder of Divine Ascent Step 3 On Banishment or Living as a Stranger Banishment implies that we forever leave the things of our past country which hinder us from attaining the aim of the religious life. Banishment involves moderate manners, a hidden wisdom, caution not known by many, a secret life, a hidden intention, secret prayer, a longing to be humiliated, a desire for difficulty, continual determination to love God, an overflowing of benevolence, an abandonment of vainglory, and a depth of stillness. The ones who love the Lord are at first very disturbed by this thought, as if they are burned with divine fire. I speak of the detachment from their own, which is done by those who love perfection in order that they might have a difficult and simple life. But excellent and worthy of praise, as it is, it needs great discernment. For not all types of banishments taken to their extreme are of value. Prophets may be dishonored in their own country, as the Lord states. So let us take care that our banishment not be an opportunity for vainglory. For banishment is a division with all things so as to keep the mind attached to God. Banishment loves and brings forth constant weeping. A banished exile is a fugitive of every bond with his brethren and strangers. When entering the solitary life with haste, do not tarry for the souls who love the world, for the thief comes at an unknown hour. In attempting to save those who are reckless and lazy, they cause many to perish with them, because over time the fire is extinguished. At the moment the flame burns inside you, flee. It is not known to you when it will be extinguished, and you will be in darkness. Everyone is not required to rescue others. The saintly apostle states, Each one will give an account of himself to God. Also he states, You who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Or said another way, I do not know if we can teach others, but instruct yourself above all. When banished, take heed to the demon of roaming and of carnal lust, for banishment provides him an opening. Admirable is detachment, but banishment is her mother. After banishing oneself for the sake of the Lord, we must have no bonds of affection lest we appear to be wandering in order to satisfy our lusts. Have you banished yourself from the world? No longer touch the world, for the passions yearn earnestly for a return. Eve was banished from paradise in opposition to her will, while the monk desires to be banished from his home. She desired yet again the tree of rebellion, and the monk would expose himself to peril from his kinsfolk. Flee from the areas of sin as if from the plague. For when fruit is absent, we no longer have the desire to consume it. Keep guard against the deception of robbers. They propose to us that there is no need to isolate ourselves from those who are in the world. They suggest that we will obtain an excellent reward if we gaze upon women and yet stay temperate. We should not believe these ideas, and instead hold the opposite. After we have spent a year or two separate from our family, and have obtained some degree of piety or remorse or temperance, then vainglory rises up within us and suggests that we should go back to our home country to Quote, educate the multitude, end quote. And as they say, to be an example to those who knew our former undisciplined state. And should we have the talent of rhetoric and some understanding, the idea comes to us that we should be saviors of souls and instructors of the world, thinking that we should not squander at sea what we have collected so well at the harbor. But we should not imitate Lot's wife, but Lot. For a soul, when it returns to its former life, is like salt, it becomes insipid and useless. Flee from Egypt, not looking back. For the hearts that glance back with fondness will not see Jerusalem, the land of peace. To those who have left their brethren in the simplicity of a child at the start, and have cleansed themselves, may with some gain return to their home country with the purpose of saving others after saving themselves. However, Moses, who was given permission to gaze upon God, and was sent by God to save his own people, came upon numerous dangers when in Egypt, which are the dark nights of the world. It is better to distress our parents rather than the Lord, because he made us and saved us, 
but parents have often destroyed the ones they love and sent them to their destruction. The one who is banished and possesses understanding sits like one who speaks a strange tongue among people of another language. Not from hate do we remove ourselves from our people or dwelling places, God forbid, but to keep away from the damage that we may incur from them. As in all things, Christ instructs us as to what is best for us. For it is evident that many times he left his fleshly parents. When he was told, Your mother and brethren are searching for you, our good Lord and Master immediately gave us an example of a dispassionate hatred. For at the time he said, My mother and my brethren are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. From Matthew twelve forty nine. Let your father be one who is capable and willing to toil with you in carrying the weight of your sins. And let your mother be remorse, which can purify you from defilement. And let your brother be your friend who labors and wars beside you in your struggle to the heights. Take for yourself an inseparable wife, the recollection of death. Let your precious children be the groanings of your heart. Let your body be your slave. And let your comrades be the angels who can assist you at the time of your death if you befriend them. This is the family who seeks the Lord. The love of God extinguishes the love of parents. He who claims to love both misleads himself. He would do well to hear him who states, No one can serve two masters. I have not come, states the Lord, to bring peace upon the earth, which is to have love of parents above love of sons and brothers who serve me, but war and the sword so as to divide those who love God from those that love the world, so as to separate the carnal from the spiritual, the haughty from the humble. For contention and division please the Lord when it comes from love for him. Take heed lest you uncover an outpouring of sentiment with your affection for the things of your dwelling, and you drown in the waters of worldly love. Do not become tearful from the testimony of your parents or friends, for if you do so, you will weep forever. When they encircle you as bees, or rather wasps, and they weep concerning you, do not for one instant hesitate, but direct the gaze of your soul to the things you have done in the past and upon your death. This way you will fend off one grief by another. Our own, or more accurately, the ones who are not of our own, with praise promise they will do everything to gratify us. However, their true goal is to impede our excellent way and soon to twist us away to their own way of life. For the solitary life we should choose abodes where there will be a lack of ease and ambition, and instead a chance for increasing our humility. For if not, we should be escaping but with our passions as companions. Conceal your high birth and do not be prideful about your distinction, so that you not be one in word and another in action. None have taken banishment so well as that excellent patriarch of whom it was said, Get you out of your country, and from your kinsfolk, and from your father's house. From Genesis 12, 1. At which point he was commanded to go to an alien and savage country. At times the Lord brings more honor to the one who has banished himself after the way of this noble patriarch. However, even if this honor is given by God, yet it is better to remove oneself with the shield of humbleness. If either men or demons laud us for our banishment, as if it were some great achievement, let us contemplate him who on account of us was banished from heaven to earth, and we will see that it will never be possible for us to make up for this. Being attached to a certain relative, or even a stranger, is hazardous. For in time it may lead us to return to the world and will extinguish the beginning of our remorse. It is not possible to gaze at heaven with one eye and at the ground with the other. It is also impossible for someone not to expose his life to peril who had not divorced himself, both in mind and body, from his brethren and from others. With much toil and exertion, a right and steady disposition is cultivated within us. But that which is accomplished with much effort can be destroyed in a moment. For bad company corrupts good manners. From 1 Corinthians 15.33 Being at times both carnal and unruly. 
The one who befriends people of the world or comes to them after he has renounced the world will most certainly fall into their nets and will corrupt his own heart by contemplating them. Or if he has not become polluted, by denouncing the ones who are corrupt, he will also become corrupt. It is impossible to conceal from our mind the organ of understanding, that which is defective and full of ignorance. Just as the palate discerns between different foods, the hearing distinguishes between ideas, the sun exposes the frailty of the eyes, and speech reveals the ignorance of a soul. However, the law of love is an inducement to try things that are beyond our ability. And so, I suppose, but do not dogmatize that following a chapter on banishment, or, should say in this step, something needs to be said about dreams, in order that we may not be in darkness about this ruse of our cunning enemies. A dream is the product of the mind, while the body is dormant. It is a fantasy, a vision of the eyes when the mind is resting. A fantasy is a raptured state when the body is not asleep. A fantasy is the manifestation of something which in reality is not there. The purpose of speaking about dreams here is clear. When we depart from our dwelling place and from relatives for the sake of the Lord and banish ourselves into exile for the love of God, then the demons try to excite us with dreams. They show us our relatives in a state where they are either in distress or dying or are held in bondage on account of us or that they are destitute. The one who trusts in dreams is like one who runs after his own shadow and attempts to catch it. The demon of vainglory will prophesy in dreams. Being cunning, he makes conjectures about the future. If these prophecies happen to come true, we are astounded. We are jubilant over the idea that we have so quickly obtained the ability to foretell the future. This demon becomes a prophet to those who trust in him but he always lies to those who hate him. Since he is a spirit, he can observe what is going on in the lower air, and when he notices that someone is near his end, he will prophesy about it to the gullible ones in dreams. But the demons do not know anything of the future from foreknowledge, because if they did have foreknowledge, then the magicians would also be able to foreknow our death. Demons will often change themselves into angels of light, or change their appearance to be that of a martyr. And then they come to us during our sleep, and they make it appear that we are in communication with them. After we wake up, they submerge us in an unholy happiness and pride. However, you can discern their crafts by this fact. Angels show us torments, judgments, and divisions. And after we wake up, we discover we are shaking and sorrowful. Once we start to believe the demons in dreams, Then they have their way with us when we are awake as well. The one who trusts in dreams is truly a novice, but the one who disbelieves dreams is intelligent. Only trust dreams that reveal tortures and judgment for you. However, if despair troubles you, then these dreams are also from the demons. This is the third step, which is equal in number to the Trinity. The one who has attained it, let him not glance to the right or left.